So good morning and welcome to St. Louis University. We are live from the Wool Ballrooms in the Bush Student Center on campus, and I'm so thrilled to be speaking to this great crowd. Welcome also to our online crowd from around the world. My name is Ted Iber, and I'm the Executive Director of the St. Louis Literary Award programs right here at St. Louis University. This program, which started in 1967 and has honored some of the greatest writers from around the world, is now one of the oldest and most prestigious awards of its kind in this country. We're here today to celebrate and learn from one of the most versatile, talented, and important writers of our time. In fact, just yesterday, Time Magazine named our 2023 St. Louis Literary Award recipient as one of the 100 most influential people of 2023, and we're so honored to have Neil Gaiman here at St. Louis University. We had a blast last night at the sold out Sheldon Concert Hall in the Arts District of Midtown in St. Louis. If you were out and about last evening, the traffic in the area was more kind of an LA vibe, uh, with Wicked playing at the Fox Theater, the Cardinals and Pirates were duking it out at Bush. Uh, we had surprise cameos from actors Nick Offerman and John Hamm at the Sheldon. And you can catch those, by the way, if you didn't get to see last night uh, live. It'll be uh, on our YouTube station uh, if you missed the show. So if you just Google St. Louis Literary Award, Neil Gaiman, it'll all come up. Today, however, we're excited to talk about the craft of writing with one of the world's greatest writers. So I say let's get to it. I'd first like to introduce our moderators uh, for this morning's discussion, and they're right here. First, I'm going to start with Martha Allen. She is a librarian and assistant dean in the St. Louis University Libraries. Millions of viewers have watched Neil's 2012 University of the Arts Extraordinary Commencement speech on YouTube, and if you've not, you should. Martha is honored to say that she was a proud parent in the room at the time when that happened on May 23rd, 2012. Martin Casas, that's, DeMar that's the guy to Martha's, well, yeah, there he is. He's the owner of a local comic book shop called Apotheosis Comics. As a lifelong comic book fan, he began his career fighting for truth, justice, and the good of all mankind, working on political campaigns and local governments all over the country. He's since retired from that now and now works to make the world a better place, one comic book at a time. Uh, it's a phenomenal, both, both Apotheosis Comics and Lounges, they're both fantastic. On Grand and on Jefferson, I say make it a point to get there. Thank you to Martha and Martin, my two favorite Martians. They're right here. Yeah, you can give them an applause. Yeah, absolutely. They are perfect for this event. Okay, and now on to our award recipient. Neil Gaiman is the New York Times bestselling and award-winning author and creator of books, graphic novels, short stories, film, and television for all ages, including Norse mythology, Neverwhere, Coraline, The Graveyard Book, the Ocean at the End of the Lane, the, and The View from the Cheap Seats. His fiction has received Newbery, Carnegie, Hugo, Nebula, World Fantasy, and Will Eisner Awards. Um, uh, excuse me, and uh, oh, there it is. American Gods, based on the 2001 novel, is a critically acclaimed Emmy-nominated TV series, and he was the writer and showrunner for the miniseries adaptation of Good Omens, based on the book he co-authored with Sir Terry Pratchett. Gaiman was also an executive producer and co-showrunner for Netflix's TV adaptation of, San, of the Sandman comic book series. Yep. He is currently developing season two of Good Omens and a TV adaptation of Anansi Boys. In 2017, Gaiman became a global goodwill ambassador to UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. Originally from England, he now divides his time between Scotland, where Good Omens and Anansi Boys are filmed, and the United States, where he's a professor in the arts at Bard College. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. I'll be back to wrap it up when we're done here, but in the meantime, please welcome the 2023 St. Louis Literary Award recipient, Neil Gaiman.
I think you got a microphone in your, right in your chair. There we go. Hiding in the cracks. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for inviting me and having me and, and being so lovely. Um, this is wonderful. Yeah, I, I mean, I obviously am very excited to have you here, but I, you told us a story the other night uh, when you were here. I've been hanging out with him for the last three days now, just so you know. Uh, <laughs> the last time you were in St. Louis, <laughs> what happened? Well, the, I think I may have come through and done a signing since then, um, and I've definitely driven through. But 1998, I was thrilled because I got my first ever invitation, like official invitation to speak at a university. Um, and I, I, up till that point, it had always been informal. You know, I, I had friends who were professors who would say, you know, can you come in and talk to my class? And I would say, sure, and I'd do that kind of thing. But I got an actual formal, we will fly you in, we will put you up, we will give you some money, please come and talk. And from Washington, and I thought this is so cool. And I came in and I was all feeling very imposter syndrome. You know, why am I here? They'll, this is so bizarre. And I was on my way into the chapel there to do the talk, um, which was a talk about myth. I remember, and, and why myths were important and what, what they were. And uh, one of the guys who brought me in just sort of hanging around backstage, and he said, yeah, it's a pity about the English department. And I said, how do you mean it's, it's a pity about the English department? He said, oh, they're boycotting this. Um, <laughs> because uh, with the, the art department uh, brought you in, you are here 100% as a guest of the art department, um, because when the English department learned that you'd written comics, they announced they were formally boycotting this. Um, so you will not meet any members of the English faculty while you are here, which I have to say, um, People always start sympathizing with me when I tell them that, and I have to explain that that made it cool, suddenly. <laughs> um, I felt illicit, like I'd been <laughs> smuggled in, and uh, it made it at least twice as much fun, and also made it very memorable. You know, I've given lots of other talks at lots of other universities over the years, and have never been boycotted. <laughs> Um, since, rather to my disappointment. Well, and, and, be, and because of your work, since then, comic books have become so mainstream, they're accepted into schools, we have people who teach about your legacy, your history in comics, uh, so thank you for that, for making it uh, mainstream and making me cool, because when I was a kid, I definitely was not, but um, next week is the 85th anniversary of the uh, publication of Action Comics number one, which was the first appearance of Superman. So, I wanted to ask you, you know, what does that character mean to you? Like it means to so many people across the world. And what can you teach our creators uh, out here in the audience today about creating characters that have a lasting legacy? I, I encountered Superman upside down, which is to say the very first time I ran into the character of Superman, I would have been five or six years old and I, my dad had a book of cartoons by uh, Jules Pfeiffer called The Explainers, which was my favorite book. I didn't care that I didn't really understand what these comics, which had all originally been published in the Village Voice, um, were actually about. I just loved them. There was something about the way that he drew. Um, there was something about the way that he paced his delivery that just made me happy. And one of those comics was about Superman. And uh, it's just Superman, and he's standing there looking super, as drawn by Jules Pfeiffer, and he's got his, 
you know, hands on his hips and his cape is blowing behind and he says, I used to be Superman. Everywhere you look, I used to rescue people. Everywhere you look, I'd be rescuing people. You know, someone in a fire, I'd rescue them. I'm, one day I pulled this chick out of a river and just for reference, I am five years old in England. As far as I'm concerned, he has pulled a baby chicken <laughs> out of a river. It made as much sense as anything else. So he pulls a chick out of a river and uh, instead of saying thank you, Superman, she wanted to know why I was wearing these tight clothes and uh, whether my need to compulsively rescue people was based on an urgent and desperate need to please people. And then she asked me about my mother. And <laughs> I got to, uh, you know, we went back and forth on this for a while. And eventually I got her to admit that although I might not be super, I was perhaps a little better than average. And then the last shot is him still going like this, but now he's wearing a suit and glasses and looks very Clark Kent. And he's saying, you know, I have a, I've, got, I've got a good job in a city we have a dog, we're doing fine. And so as far as I was concerned, that was what Superman was. <laughs> Everything else I've read after that has been a peculiar gloss <laughs> on the idea of Superman as somebody who pulls baby chickens out of rivers, <laughs> marries them, and has a desperate need to please people. <laughs> Having said that, um, you know, I, I loved... Superman. I love the Superman comics. The, the, for me, my, my golden era of Superman was Kurt Swan and Murphy Anderson in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. um, but I always sort of, but there was always a sort of a wary respect for Superman, going, okay, I like you, you're, you're inspiring, you're cool. Really, I like my characters properly screwed up. I, <laughs> you know, it the choice was one Bernie Wrightson drawn issue of Swamp Thing against my entire Superman collection. I would have been sad, but Superman would have gone, and a muck-encrusted mo monster shambling out of the swamp <laughs> would have stayed because that was where my heart was. What about... Uh the lasting impact of the character, and is there anything as you've created Sandman, you've created some other characters, is there anything that, that a writer should know about creating something that has a legacy to it like that? Um, I, I don't think there is anything that you can tell a writer about creating something that has a legacy like that, because none of us ever know. You can't plan for it. The people who plan for it fail because, you know, I remember Todd McFarlane at the beginning of Image calling me up and going, you know, the only thing I can tell you, Neil, is that, you know, my spawn is going to be bigger than Batman and it's going to last longer than Batman. And, you know, and that was the way that he was treating spawn. He figured he was creating something that was going to go on forever and that people would care about. And, you know, the world has its own opinion on the matter and that's okay. <laughs> Um, so I just don't, I don't think you can plan for that. I think you can, you can hope, um, but at the end of the day, what's going to be important is what works. There were hundreds, um, probably thousands of heroes that followed Superman, the ma vast majority of whom are tiny forgotten footnotes that even mad comics fans would be find it impossible to identify. Um, with Sandman, I assumed I was creating something that was going to be fundamentally disposable. The era that I started Sandman, um, there were no graphic novels. So, that's kind of hard to imagine, but, but ongoing comics titles did not have collections of things. Um, there had been a few collections. That, you know, Dark Knight Returns had come out as a book. 
Watchmen had come out as a book. I think Camelot 3000 had come out as a book. There were a tiny number of these things, but what was important about them was they were all stories that finished. And other than that, if you wanted to find out what had happened in an ongoing monthly comic, you would go to your comic store and hope they had some up on the wall with the back issues and that they weren't going to charge you too much for it. You know, I, I remember paying something like 15 pounds, which was a lot of money to me, to get the first Alan Moore Swamp Thing. Because, and it had only been coming out for about a year or so, but I wanted, you know, I wanted to find out how it began. Um, so that was how it worked. And Sandman was the first comic due to a series of bizarre accidents. Ever the first mainstream comic where they collected the on, an ongoing storyline while it was still going on. The first Sandman graphic novel was, was The Doll's House, um, which was Sandman's 8 to 16, the original version. And it had never been done before. And it was successful, and a couple of months later, they brought out the first book, Preludes and Nocturnes, and the third. And uh, many, many comic shop owners were very unhappy with this. <laughs> as far as they were concerned, you know, they were making their money on charging people a lot of money for Sandman number one and Sandman number two, and Sandman number three, and now people could just get the story. Were we out of our friggin' minds? We were destroying the entire basis that comic shops worked on. But you did something that hadn't been done before. Women were coming into comic book stores and were reading comics for Sandman, and that's why they started creating graphic novels. So this is the reason why women are now one of the largest groups of readers of comics. I, I, I think we definitely helped. I used to get people who looked like the comic store guy on The Simpsons <laughs> coming up to me in San Diego, sticking grubby fit hands out and saying, you are the reason women come into my store. <laughs> I had not seen any women in my store and then Sam and, and then the women, they come into my store. And I'm like, if you just sweep it occasionally. <laughs> They will come back. Um. Okay, now we're going to switch to a question about writing process. And with all the adaptations, auditions, and awards, thank you for coming to St. Louis to receive this award. It means so much. When do you ever have time to write? And what is your preferred writing environment? Um, writing... The, the hardest thing about doing the television stuff, which is one reason why I'm very much looking forward to a future in which I retire from making television and in my retirement perhaps take up, oh, writing, um, <laughs> is that I'm in a world right now where I have to make writing time. And I don't like making writing time. Writing time should be the default. Everything else should be the thing that creeps in around the edges. Um, and I've, I've rented a little cabin in the woods um, from a local sort of art commune kind of thing that's been there for, I think at this point, about 120 years out in Woodstock. And I, I get to uh, go up to my little cabin in the woods and uh, where there is basically no cell phone reception. And I had to explain to them when I rented it that no, no, I really don't want internet. No, no, I'm serious. I don't want internet. No, I understand that you would put it in for nothing. I understand it's already there. You can turn it off. I don't <laughs> actually want internet. And that's the best thing for me is just I, I go up there there's ink and paper, and I sit and I do my writing there. Wonderful. 
Um, you stated in 2012, during that wonderful speech, <laughs> that distribution channels are ever-changing. It's now 11 years later. What advice do you have for writers, musicians, and other artists in terms of distributing their work? What are your thoughts on self-publishing, either using predatory publishers, as a library term, or social media channels? Um, well, I think for a start, I was right in 2012 when I said it's ever-changing. And when I said that the, um, the gatekeepers were leaving their gates, which creates chaos and creates opportunity. Um, and now it's 11 years later, I perceive a lot more chaos. Um, I watch new gatekeepers rising and crumbling. Um, you know, it's really weird right now checking in on Twitter. It's like, you know, the last days of the Roman Empire. <laughs> Everybody's just checking their watches and finding out if the Goths are coming over the hills. Um, and you're going, okay, well, this, this thing that's grown up, this ecosystem of the last decade of Twitter, of Facebook, um, that seems to be going the way of MySpace and LiveJournal and that kind of stuff. Um, do I know what's going to come next? Nope, having a clue. Do I know that something will come next and probably a whole bunch of somethings and whether it's people reading their novels on the equivalent of TikTok or whether it's going to be people you know, we're already in a world in which Kickstarter was in 2012, people using Kickstarter were accused of being beggars in the streets and, and being bad people and so on and so forth. And currently, I believe Kickstarter is either the first or the second largest comics publisher um, technically in America because of the, that's where the stuff is coming out from. People know that's how they can get. It's, it's a fabulous way to publish. Um, is it still going to be Kickstarter? Is it still going to be Patreon? Is it going to be something else? It'll be something else. But that's part of the fun of it, is I think people right now are going to get to invent and get to imagine. Um, do I think that traditional publishers um, are going to be around for another 15 or 20 years at least? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, you know, they got some things more right than the music business, mostly by coming second and watching some of the mistakes that the music business made. Um, and I also think that, you know, things like the Kindle app, the Audible app, um, got more things right than they got wrong. I do not think either of them is perfect in any way, but I do think they got enough right. Um, and I love the fact we're now in a world in which people are listening to books a lot. In 2004, I went into the offices of HarperCollins, my publishers in New York, and the head of their audio publishing division um, told me that she'd quit. And I said, I'm so sorry to hear it. Why have you quit? And she said, because audio is dead. <laughs> and I said, why is audio dead? And she said, audio is obviously dead because they have just announced they're going to stop making cassette players for cars. <laughs> and we cannot get the economics of bringing out books on CD to work. We're bringing out these 30 CD things, and it's not even the cost of making the CDs, it's actually the cost of the packaging is killing us, and we cannot get the shelf space 
in Barnes and Noble to get all our books on audio it there, and it just is not going to work, and we're doomed. Um, so I'm quitting. And I said, fair enough. And then the next time, six months later, I went into the office. Her assistant, her, well, her, her, her deputy had now taken over, and her deputy said, have you see, ever seen one of these before? And she pulled out something the size of a cigarette pack, and she said, it's called an iPod. I was going to say, I was going to say. And, um, you know, the whole, the whole world changed. And we're now in a world in which you can be instantly given an audiobook of any length. And they are, you know, in the old days, they were 3% of your book sales. And now they're 25% or more. Hmm. So it's a... So basically, that's, that's all my way of maundering about the fact that I think trying to predict will be a, anything specific is going to be a failure. All I can say is if you are a young author, and you can be a young author at 100, um, but if you're a young author, young artist, and you are creating and you want to get your stuff out there, be water, just drip. Find your level, use whatever means you can to get your work out there, including some of the ancient forgotten ones, like Xeroxing it and sticking it up places and stuff, um, because all of that will work too. I think we just found our clip from the, the be water and drip. That is a great, uh, it's great advice. You had mentioned something about um, McFarlane earlier, and you know, hate to bring it up, but you've got a, a history of St. Louis and McFarlane back in, when uh, there was a copyright issue with one of the creators you created for him. What did and then three you, of the characters? Three of the characters, yes. I wound yeah. up owning three characters by the end of it. So, with TV, media, radio, comics, what advice can you give young artists about copyright and making sure that they know how to protect and value their work properly? Because with we just talked a whole conversation about Superman, Jerry Siegel, Joe Schuster, the creators of Superman were practically wiped out of existence financially yeah. uh, because they sold the DC when they were too young, didn't understand the laws. As a, one of America's great writers, what do you, how do you advise people to protect their, their intellectual property? Um, first of all, I would say read, read. Get, you know, go to your library, pick up a book on copyright, pick up, you know, the, there are lots of good writer's guides. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't know where to look in a library, talk to the librarians and they will point you to the places and to the things that you want. Um, educate yourself. You know, I survived dealing with a, you know, an unethical publisher because I knew the law. And I knew that, you know, his attitude was, I am rich, sue me. My attitude was, I cannot afford to sue you, so I will write a New York Times bestseller and then I will sue you. <laughs> um, which worked actually just fine. I don't recommend it as a strategy. <laughs> it, it could have not worked, but it did work. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I would say educate yourself. I would say get things in writing. Um, and I'd say put things in writing as well. You know, and, but, but the fundamental one is just know your rights. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, I love that Gaiman versus McFarlane is a huge case that actually established creator rights. And it's one that they now teach. You know, young lawyers come up to me and say, you are the Gaiman of Gaiman v. McFarlane. <laughs> and I say, yes, I am. And he said, that was the best bit. You know, and, and that's so much fun. I, I think partly because both of the judges in the case had too much fun writing their judgments. Um, Richard Posner in, in Chicago 
and uh, oh, I've forgotten her name, and the wonderful judge in the, the follow-up case on derivative characters. And you could tell they both just sort of got way into it and started making stuff up and inventing their own characters and explaining why Todd was stealing stuff, and it was great. So um, anyway, highly recommend. Look after yourself. Get it in writing. Are there any legal resources that young writers should take advantage of? Um, none that I can think of offhand. I mean, I, I, I'm, you know, I would always recommend um, finding the relevant trade organizations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, it was I was I was in Britain, and the Society of Authors was there, and the Society of Authors in the UK offers a service where if you're a member of the Society of Authors, they will have a lawyer look over your contracts for you. If you don't have a lawyer and you don't have an agent, they will, they will check it out for you, and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm not as au fait with the American equivalents, and I probably should be. But I know the, the SFWA, Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, is fantastic. The HWA, the Horror Writers of America. Um, you know, find your area of interest and see if there are people who can help, who can advise. And sometimes who can just lean on your publishers. You know, every now and again. I've, I've used the Society of Authors when I had a publisher in the UK who had a book that, they, that had been out of print for six years and contractually they had to give me the rights back. And they wouldn't because they were earning money from sub-licenses abroad. And they just said no. And I'm like, well, you know, per the contract, it's been out of print and you have to give me the rights back. And they're like, yeah, no. We like this money coming in from abroad and we're never gonna bring your book back into print and we're never giving you the rights back. And for that one, I just went to the Society of Authors and said, you know, this is a real publisher. You have to go and cough ominously at them. <laughs> and a few weeks later, with very bad grace, they gave me back the rights to my book. Congratulations. Um, I am not a stalker, <laughs> but... Well, not, okay. not, not Very a few thing. sentences that begin like that end well. <laughs> but in doing research for the interview, I saw on your older son's Twitter account that he recently read The Witches to his child. Have you had a publishing house request or insist changes to language in any of your works in light of the recent changes to Raul Dahl's works, what are your thoughts on the practice of sanitizing um, published works to remove offensive, racist, or sexually explicit language? Um, not in the US or the UK that I know of. Um, or, or, you know, nobody's ever come to me and said, hey, we, we want to take this out, we want to change this thing. Um, I've definitely had it and have had to make judgment calls and have never been satisfied with any of the judgment calls made from abroad. Because every now and again, I will be told, you know, they, they want to leave out this page or this mention or can they lose this word in the translation. And Sometimes I just say no, and I understand the book will not be published and will not be available for people in that country. Um, and sometimes I go, you know, can I live without that moment I, or that word or that thing? I guess I can because I would rather that the people, you know, there's one and, one and a half billion people who can get access to the book and yes, they will lose that paragraph, um, but they'll have the thing, and that's never a comfortable decision. Um, 
And that, uh, but they always come, those ones always come in apologetically from publishers saying basically, you know, this is a governmental thing. It is against the law in our country to use this word, this description, this thing. Um, what do we do? You know, are you okay with us losing this paragraph? Having said that, I'm also sure that the ones that reach me are probably 5% of those things because most of the time I suspect the publisher will simply quietly do it and know that I, I do not read this language. I am never going to know. Um, you know, I'm never actually gonna say to somebody, excuse me, would you do a word for word translation for me of this Chinese edition or whatever? And so if it happens, it probably happens unbeknownst to me. Um, and that, that's all sort of me wandering around I think what I think is a much weirder, bigger subject that's going on right now, which is particularly with children's books, are they commercial entities or are they works of art? Um, and also, are they modifiable? You know, roll dull. If you read a first edition version of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, or better yet, talk to Jane Yolen about what it was like to be a young assistant editor in the publishing house when Charlie and the Chocolate Factory came in, when um, you know, the Oompa Loompas were not orange. They were, they were small and brown and they came from an island and they were kind of slaves and it was all very, very uncomfortable. And there were long arguments in the publishing house trying to persuade Roald Dahl to change them. And he wouldn't. And then when it came time to make a movie, um, the same arguments happened and this time Roald Dahl listened. And now they became orange and mythical. Um, and still perhaps not entirely comfortable, but a lot more comfortable than the previous iteration. And that, that's an author deciding to change something. You know, I actually, over the protest of my publisher, once took out a sentence in a children's book of mine because I had had parents write to me and say this, you know, what did you mean by this line? And this made my kid uncomfortable. And, and I went, ah, that's actually a line that I stole from my daughter. <laughs> and, um, and at the time I just liked it because it was about the way that kids can be cruel. But I really did not think that through and I'm losing that line. And the publisher was like, we love that. And I'm like, yeah, it's going. Um, so it, it goes the other way. After an author's dead, then I would prefer that nobody messed with their text. Having said that, I also did not find it in my heart to object in any way when I heard 15 or 20 years ago that the Hugh Lofting estate had rewritten the Dr. Doolittle books because they are monstrously racist and awful. And they're also, in any bits where Dr. Doolittle is not in Africa, um, lovely and sweet and wonderful and inspiring and good. And then he goes off to Africa and it's like, oh no, stop it. And it was cringe-making and embarrassing and awful for me when I was seven. I mean, this is not me as a, you know, 62-year-old woke person saying, oh, that Dr. Doolittle. This is me as a kid gun. This is really weird, you know, and <laughs> you guys, it, this is just wrong. This feels felt wrong then. I mean, it felt sort of weirdly dated and musical. So I didn't have a problem with that, but I didn't have a problem with it because I was like, well, the Dr. Doolittle books are also a 
commercial thing. They exist. There are Dr. Doolittle films. There always will be. It is a good thing that these Dr. Doolittle books exist and kids are reading. And that, for me, is always the bottom line. Well, I'm going to, uh, we're going to deviate from the script here and go with an audience question. Uh, this is from Anna Mueller. Congratulations. Uh, so Anna writes, uh, your work was widely well received in my home country of Brazil during the e early years of your career. How do you feel about, how do you feel how your writing resonates with other cultures around the world? It's been a really weird education. So Brazil came first. Um, America and the UK were reading Sandman and then really early, like within the first six months of Sandman, Brazil started publishing Sandman. Um, in an era of nightmarish inflation, which meant the cover price would double from month to month, and I would worry about the Brazilians. And they were beautiful, beautiful editions. They were actually nicer than the American ones. Um, and suddenly Sandman was huge in Brazil, and I was a star in Brazil. And I loved that, um, in the same way that I loved when the books went huge in Poland, in the same way I loved it when I realized that particularly the comics, but also the books had somehow gone huge in the Philippines. Um, and I loved it mostly because I didn't have a clue why it was. It didn't really make, it didn't make any sense that if I went to Brazil, I was the Beatles. If I went to Argentina, I was anonymous. But I loved that there was some kind of weird resonance. Um, you know, there are countries where my stuff works, countries where it doesn't. I think probably some of it has something to do with, with the translators. Um, but I was even watching it on, on the weirdest place was with Sandman on Netflix because there are these bizarre charts that you can access on the web that tells you what's the top show around the world, you know, over whatever it is. They, Netflix is in, I think, about 90 countries. And... Uh, and I got to watch the ones that we were huge in and broke out and just stayed up there at number one. We were, we were weirdly, um, the one that actually really made me go, I have to go to this place, is also, of course, the most difficult because we stayed at number one in Ukraine um, for just month after month after month, even after we'd fallen off finally fell off, you know, in, in the US and finally fell off in the UK. We're still going strong in Ukraine. And I thought, I don't know why, uh, but I love that that's happening. Whatever's going on there, there are people taking comfort in Sandman. Last night you mentioned your older son, Michael, was the inspiration for the graveyard book. For those who were not there, Neil mentioned that he took his son to the graveyard that was near his house so his son could ride his tricycle. St. Louis has many wonderful cemeteries, <laughs> but I, and I'm going to mention two in particular, Bellefontaine and, Bellefontaine and Calvary cemeteries. Tennessee Williams is in Calgary against his wishes. He did not want to come back to St. Louis, but his family said, you're coming. <laughs> And then um, people travel far and wide to view the Wainwright tomb in Bell Fountain. Do you have favorite cemeteries? Where are they and why? I do. Um, let's see. Uh, my first ever favorite cemetery was the one literally across the road from us in Sussex that I talked about. Um, it's the one that the inspiration for the witch's headstone came from because I was told 
as a kid that there were witches buried in the cemetery, which made it extra spooky. Um, and I was so disappointed when I was old enough to really figure out, because it was all, there was a thing on these three tombstones about the people being burnt in the high street. Um, and I was so disappointed when I realized they were Protestants. Um, <laughs> you know, witches was just cooler. So that was my first. Um, my second favorite, and, and I, I used bits of lots of my favorite cemeteries in the graveyard book. I would just indiscriminately steal from cemeteries. Um, so, let's see, Highgate Cemetery West is one. Uh, there are two Highgate cemeteries. There's Highgate Cemetery East, where Karl Marx is buried, and Douglas Adams, and it's very orderly and sensible. And there's Highgate Cemetery West on the other side of the road, where they you used to not be allowed to walk without a guide because there were too many Victorian cemeteries where they dug really deep holes, planning to bury lots of people in a family thing. So they would go down 20 or 30 feet and uh, just cover it with boards. And then World War I, everything went sort of weird, and lots of families died out without issue, and lots of young men died, and it all just sort of fell apart a bit. So if you go wandering there, there are lots of rotten boards, and you can fall 20 or 30 feet into open graves, and they don't want that to happen. Um, and whether or not that has ever happened, um, they were having a lot of trouble in the 1970s with people convinced that there was a vampire in the Highgate Cemetery creeping into the cemetery at night and trying to stake corpses and stuff. So I ne was never quite sure whether that was part of it as well, but I stole the Egyptian walk in, um, in the graveyard book from there. Um, Glasgow Necropolis is marvelous because it's on a hill looking over Glasgow. That's the name of it, the Glasgow Glasgow Necropolis, Necropolis the city of wow. the dead. It's next to Glasgow. It's glorious. Um, and um, there, there's, um, oh gosh, I've forgotten the official name. Um, but there's the, there, there, there was a cemetery that we did some filming in. Um, I shot my film, a short film about John Bolton there. And um, it's, um, and, and I fell in love with just, again, the ramshackle nature of it. I like cemeteries that feel cemetery, semi-abandoned, as if the ivy and the wilderness and the foxes um, have started taking over the cemetery once again. Um, in 1986, you ended your run in the Sandman. Um, why at the height of your popularity at the time uh, did you decide to end the story? And what advice do you have uh, for creators in the room today about endings? Um, well, I ended it for two or three huge reasons. The biggest wit of which was it was not intended to be a soap opera. It was intended to be a story, and stories have beginnings and middles and ends, and it's the end that makes it important. And if a story never ends, then it, for me, it is less important. Um, you know, I marvel at DC and Marvel, who have, you know, an 85-year-old universes and you know, particularly um, in my lifetime, have made these universes into giant stories that never end and never can end. Um, but for me, what was important was that it would end. And it was really hard to persuade DC of that. I remember the first time, I, you know, I, I waited a year or two 
And then I said to uh, the president and publisher of DC Comics at the time, Jeanette Kahn, I said, you know, when Sandman is done, I would like it to end. When I finished my bit, and she said, Neil, it, you know it doesn't work like that. Um, you know, when Superman, when a writer finishes on Superman, another writer comes in and writes Superman. And when a writer finishes on Batman, another writer comes in and writes Batman. That's how it works. Um, the idea is that you've created something that will carry on. You know, when you leave the sandpit, other people come and play with the toys you left in the sandpit. And I said, oh, okay. And from that point on, all I did was in interviews, whenever people would ask me about Sandman and whether it would end, I would always say, well, I hope it does. Obviously, if Sandman ends when I'm finished, I will continue working with DC Comics after that. And if it carries on with somebody else, that will be the end of my working relationship with DC Comics, and it will have been a very pleasant relationship. And then a year or two after that, Karen Berger, my editor, phoned me up, and she said, you know, we, we can't really keep Sandman going after you finish it, can we? And I said, no, you really can't. <laughs> um, and what I love is that what... Again, it's that weird thing, like, like the thing I was talking about earlier with the graphic novels, where it's kind of unthinkable, because now the idea that you would have a writer who would do something and it would finish, there have been lots of them. Um, it's kind of common. You, you, a writer comes up with something, they do it, it finishes, it was done. Um, and I love that that's become a thing in comics. I love that it's, things are allowed to end. Um, because I think ends give everything meaning and ends give everything shape. I'm gonna take another question from the audience. This is from Caitlin. And it dovetails with a question I had. So this is gonna seem long, but what character of yours would you choose to play in a television adaptation of your work and as I said, it dovetails to a question I had was, that tuna didn't salad itself. <laughs> You've had multiple cameos on The Simpsons. Simpsons. Any plans for any more cameos? And what would your dream cameo be in your television adaptation? Well, the great thing about cartoons in particular is that you just get to play you. And uh, so in The Simpsons, I got to play an evil version of me, um, which was great. <laughs> and, um, and I had much too much fun. And in Arthur, I got to play a semi-imaginary cat version of me, who at one point turns up in somebody's falafel. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I... I, I love getting to be me in things because I don't have to act, I just have to try and remember the lines. I was me in the Big Bang Theory. That was, that was incredibly fun. Um, I, but I'm incredibly glad that I don't really have to actually act, mostly because I have now worked with real actors and I know what is involved and I know how good they are and I don't actually have any desire to do that thing. I would much rather admire David Tennant and Michael Sheen for being the kind of people who can do that thing. You know, when people come up to me and say, you should be the next Doctor Who, it's like, no, I shouldn't. <laughs> um, well, I think you should be a host on Saturday Night Live and as a librarian, I did the, the, the librarian thing and Googled it to see whether you were on already. And it said, but there's actually a campaign to get you to be a host <laughs> on Saturday Night Live. And who, I think that would, would be amazing. Who would your musical guest be? Yeah. <laughs> that would be interesting. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. I don't, I mean, I, 
I definitely, as a young man, loved the idea of, of acting. As I've got older, um, I find I get to get most of my acting yearnings out of the way by reading stuff, um, reading my books, getting to play all of the characters. Um, with the, I, I don't know how many of you have run into the Audible adaptation of Sandman. There are three acts so far, it's so good. Um, but I, I get to narrate that. And I do keep saying to Dirk Maggs that I think they could afford a proper narrator. And he's like, yeah, but we like you. We want you doing it. I would rather they got Derek Jacobi. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but I do just love getting to do the audiobooks. I love getting to do that stuff, getting to pretend. And also, I miss reading to my kids. Um, Maddie, my, who is now almost 30, I, I still remember the dark day. We were halfway through the first Philip Pullman book. She was about 12 going on 13. We had been reading, I'd been reading to her every night pretty much of her life. Even if I was away, I would call in and read to her. And then we were halfway through that, and she said, you know, I think I'll finish it on my own, Dad. And I was like, no. Um, and with, with Ash, who is now seven, it's worse. He will not let me read to him. He says it's really irritating. And he insists on reading to me. So when we read at night, he's doing all the reading. And I just miss that thing of reading to kids. I, get, I miss doing the voices. Um, I miss trying to... F and I also used to love the thing of revisiting books that I thought I knew. Uh, because if you're reading a book aloud, you're, you will always find things in it that you didn't know were there. Well, uh, so we're almost out of time. But uh, we've got some lightning questions that we've been dying to ask you. And then we're going to get to audience questions because that's the most important thing here. So the most important question I wanted to ask you is as a notable Minneapolis resident, do you know Lizzo and have you been invited to Prince's house before? <laughs> yeah. Have you ever been to Prince's house? Yeah. I have um, never been to Prince's house. Do not know Lizzo. Um, was uh, when I arrived in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area in 1992, um, all of my friends who were all science fiction writers or, you know, no good Nick Renfair people <laughs> and stuff, um, they'd all been extras in Purple Rain and all had fabulous stories about standing around while Purple Rain was being shot. <laughs> Although my favorite um, story of all was my friend Lenny Henry, who was shooting a documentary. And uh, he was shooting a documentary on rock, and they shot a bit of it at, at Paisley Park. Yeah. And um, there was, he was just watching you know, somebody was doing something they were filming and a door opened upstairs and Lenny, who is very big and has a fabulous voice, was just like, you know, can you shut up up there? Can you shut up and shut that door and stop making noise up there? We're shooting, we're filming. And then uh, the, the filming carried on and finished. And at the end of it, Lenny turned to the person who'd been looking after them at Paisley Park and he said, now, now we're done. He said, is there any chance that I'm going to meet Prince? And she said, not after you shouted at him like that. <laughs> okay, inquiring minds want to know, do you snack when you're writing? I'm not a great snacker. What I am is a maker of cups of tea. So, next lightning round question. Lord of the Rings, who would you rather share a cup of tea with? 
Bilbo or Frodo? Bilbo. Okay, good. That's my answer. Too. Yes, good, good. Who do you identify with, Boromir or Faramir? Oh, neither. I, okay. I, 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 nobody who gets to stride around. Um, I, I identify with the weird characters out on the edges of Lord of the Rings. Um, you know, muttering things in, in Elvish or, you know, I mean, I, I, if I'm going to identify with anybody, it's going to be somebody like Tom Bombadil or Bjorn or those characters who aren't even properly explained. You're not even sure what they're doing. Have, have they wandered in from a different book? You know? Okay, Battle of the Warriors. Swamp Thing versus King Kong. Oh, um... Swamp Thing. I mean, King Kong is big but stupid. Swamp Thing is an animated plant god. If nothing else, you know, you watch King Kong getting vines growing up him and strangling both him and the Empire State, but that would be a cool comic. Um, Are you enjoying the ride? There's a... Um, Song by the Mag... No, it's not by the Magnetic Fields. It's by a different Stephen Merritt incarnation, the Gothic Archies, um, on the Lemony Snicket Series of Unfortunate Events album mm -hmm. that the Gothic Archies, which in that incarnation, I think, is, is mostly Stephen Merritt and Daniel Handler. Um, anyway, and there is a song on there called How Do You Slow This Thing Down? <laughs> Which every now and again I find myself playing, listening to, singing along with, and um, thinking, you know, I, I, I am enjoying the ride, but I would love to slow this thing down. Oh, yeah. Okay, here's an audience question from Chris. How do you maintain excitement for projects that take longer than you'd hoped? Every project takes longer than you've <laughs> hoped. There are no projects that do not take longer than you've hoped. Sandman, I figured, was going to be three years of my life. And it's taken up good chunks of the last 34. Um, you know, Coraline took me well over a decade to write and publish. Uh, the Graveyard Book took me about 25 years from having the idea and first trying it to actually writing it, knowing what I was doing. Um, so I'm just used to everything taking a ridiculously long time. And I do it by... I'm sort of one of those people who irritates my family and children and people by being hard to get excited about things. But that also means that, you know, three years into making season two of Good Omens, I'm still excited about it. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I can't wait until you guys see what we did in Good Omens season two. We it's very different to season one, and it's exactly the same, and you will fall in love with Crowley and Aziraphale, you have new characters to meet and love, you have characters to meet and hate. Um, it's wonderful, we have, you know, Nazi zombies, we have um, yes. Yes. all sorts of cool things that you're not expecting, and I conceived it in 2019. Um, COVID meant that everything got put on hold, but we got it written and we got it shot through there and we've spent the last literally 15 months getting it finished and ready and in the summer you'll get to see it and I'm still excited, but I never when, oh my God, excited at any point. It's just a sort of, you keep, you have to just keep going because things will take a long time to happen. Yeah. 
Neil, you've been so gracious with your time. We know you got a plane to catch, and I want to thank you for coming out here today. It's been a dream come true for mine. A lot of people in the room today to meet you. So everyone give it up for Neil Gaiman. Thank you. Uh, Thank you all. Thank you to our audience. You guys have been fantastic. Thank you to our online audience as well. Neil Gaiman, Martha Allen, Martin Casas, thank you for a fantastic hour. Left Bank Books has pre-signed books by Neil. And if you look at our socials, you can see him signing yesterday. Amazing. To all of our student workers here for the Literary Award programs, thank you for your amazing work. And next year, I hope to see you guys here because for 2024, we are welcoming the author, Jamaica Kincaid, as our 2024 award recipient. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend.